What's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Proverbial Life Podcast. This is a podcast where we encourage Christians to look to Christ, live wisely, and leave a legacy behind for generations to follow. If this is your first time watching the Proverbial Life Podcast, do me a favor and subscribe to the YouTube channel at youtube.com, the Proverbial Life. All right, y'all, let's get right into it. This is part two of SBC Pastors Gone Rogue. In the first recording, we talked about what it means to be black in America. So if you have not seen that, go back and listen to that episode. Today, the question that is going to be asked by the white pastor at the top right corner is going to be the question, have we made progress since Ferguson? So I'm going to get right into it. I'm going to stop and start as needed. But in the meantime, oh, let me say this by way of reminder, these people that are up here, all pastors, okay, they are pastors. And the reason why that is important is because they have congregants that they are shepherding. They have people that are following their lead and they are teaching people how to live lives that glorify God. And so what they're going to be teaching their people are some of the things that they're teaching here on this live stream. And, uh, you know, th this should be troubling for us, you know, especially when you think about the SBC. A lot of these uh, SBC pastors are being funded by the convention. And so that means the normal church going Christian at your typical Southern Baptist church is going to be funding these ideas. And I really want to encourage you to reconsider the money you're giving to pastors like these who are promoting ideas that are anti-biblical. Okay. These teachings are divisive. These teachings are, uh, they, they naturally bring a separation of individuals on the basis of the color of one's skin. And so again, I just want to lay that out there on the outset that these are SBC pastors and missionaries who are shepherding the local church. And along with other stuff, I'm sure is good. There is this poison of wokeness and this wrong and unbiblical and ungodly concepts of the social justice movement. So let's get right into it. Let's go. Let's listen to it. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. Being black in America is traumatic. Yeah. So, so obviously, man, this, this stuff has been going on for a long time and it seems at different points. It's um, been more of a topic. It's come up more of in our, um, you know, social conversations Looking back to to Ferguson, do you guys feel like we've made any progress since that point? No. All right. So Ferguson, what he's referring to is the Michael Brown killing by Officer Darren Wilson. This is around 2014. And he's asking the question, have we made progress since Ferguson? Uh, Ferguson, Missouri was the location in which uh, Michael Brown was killed. Now, th this is important because you're going to hear their answer. And I'm going to tell you what you don't hear, because this wasn't the narrative that was spun in the media. And this wasn't the narrative that was championed by the former president, Barack Obama. Uh, and, th and that's this. Michael Brown was not an innocent victim. Michael Brown was hoodlum. Michael Brown was a thug. And I mean that in the clearest way you can picture a thug, right? Uh, irrespective of his color, although we can get there, we're going to get there in a moment. A thug can be black or white or Hispanic or Latino, whatever. It doesn't matter on the racial boundaries. So, so Michael Brown was a thug. He was a troublemaker with the law. And prior to him being killed by Officer Wilson, he was stealing and shoplifting in a local convenience store comes out and he tries to murder a cop. The whole narrative of hands up, don't shoot was substantiated as not true by eyewitnesses, you know, 
that Brown was trying to attack Officer Wilson, and in self defense, Officer Wilson justly shot him dead. Now, that's important for me to say it that way because I want to read a passage to you that I think we often just don't think of in its proper context when it comes to justice. So let me read this passage to you. Okay, so let's look at this. Romans chapter 13, it says this, starting at verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Okay, so we can stop right there and apply this to Michael Brown and say that because he resisted authority in this sense, he received judgment. Verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. He is God's servant for good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. So, what Michael Brown received was a just reward for his sin. Now, these pastors aren't going to say that. They aren't going to say that. When I say reward, I'm, I'm, I'm coming from uh, Romans chapter 2, right? The, the, the wage, and, and going into chapter 3, the wages of sin is death, okay? So uh, God brings judgment on sinners who don't abide to his covenant and his standards. And if you are a criminal who's out there breaking the law and you're trying to kill a police officer, Okay, the police officer has the right to defend himself as God's deacon and to protect his life. Because if you kill him and you have the gall to kill a, a police officer, then you are an unruly individual in society and you'll kill anyone. So what, what happened to Michael Brown is unfortunate in that he dies in his sin without Christ if he was not a believer. But it is a just reward for his sin. Now, these individuals don't mention any of that. The assumption is that Michael Brown was innocent and he was innocent on the basis of the color of his skin. And the narrative is believed, hands up, don't shoot. So the question is, have we made progress since then? In other words, the implication is that was unjust. That was wicked. It was a black man being killed at the hands of a white officer. So it fits into this narrative of the Black Lives Matter movement. And, and you're going to hear this in a moment. And so because it fits into that narrative, then it's perfect, right? And so the question is, have we changed since then? Have we gotten any better since then? Okay, I'm going to let them answer that question. I guess we're about six, seven years removed from there. Do you feel like we've we've made any progress since Ferguson? I mean, that's a question that is constantly asked, and the question I, I kind of revert back is progress in what? Yep, you I know. Was the same thing. So, like, like what are we talking about? Like progress in, like what? That yeah. to me is is the question because it's like there's obvious. So, so again, the 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 implication is because you can see by the the agreement of the black pastor at the top left-hand corner is that, uh, you know, progress in what? Black people are still being killed at the hands of white officers. We're still being disproportionately murdered unjustly, but this wasn't unjust. And when you look at the other cases of black individuals who were killed, some of them were unjust. A lot of them weren't. Okay. If you want to talk about Philando Castillo, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly. 
that 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 wasn't that that wasn't necessary. That was unjust, right? But but when you talk about the other scenarios, especially it, it more locally in our day, even even with the the uh, George Floyd situation, okay, uh, yeah, that that was unjust, and we see that that justice has been is prevailing, right? And and that this officer and the officers involved received punishment. I don't think it was uh, in accordance to. God's law, God's standard of justice, but nonetheless, in our societal time, sure, and there's going to be a hearing and all that, right? Uh, but, but again, the assumption is that this is automatically unjust, and because it's unjust, they have to ask the question: uh, in, in what way have we made progress? Right? Certain things. The fact that the you got the whole nation, nation like global that are starting to say black lives matter and rallying around this yeah. and saying, that's progress. So the black lives matter rallying the movement rallying behind the ideology of the black lives matter movement is good. And that's progress. Just a reminder, these are Southern Baptist pastors and missionaries. Right. So, but at the same time, the fact that we're still talking about the same things and the fact that, like, to me, sometimes it it, it hurts. So some of I get the sentiment, but it, it hurts when I hear my white brothers and sisters saying that we need to take a posture of listening. I know that's the advice that we're giving, but sure. what, I, what I hear, what it hurts me is that when we say that we need to take a posture of listening, it's like, yes, we need to listen. However, we need to listen in the same way you listen to your wife who's being hurt at the time. Are you okay? This is being um this is interesting. I I, I think about this and I'm trying to communicate I'll, I'll try to communicate without what I'm thinking here. You know, when when someone when someone is killed, right? You turn on your news and you see, okay, Amid Arbery uh killed uh by two white men who uh were you know, maybe it seems like they went out of their way to approach Ahmed Arbery and eventually he ended up getting killed. Okay, so I, I see that. I see that from where I'm at. What's my response? Number one, it's a Christian. And then as an, a, an individual in this world who sees this, what, what is my response? Well, well, as a Christian, my response is that I'm grieved. I'm grieved because another individual regardless of the color of their skin, is dying without Jesus Christ. Now, assuming that he didn't know Jesus Christ, okay? I'm grieved by that, okay? Now, I'm not weeping and mourning because I don't know him personally. So I don't have that vantage point of knowing his family and his cousins and his uncles and his aunts and his friends, right? And so if I did... If some if, if Amit Arbery's family went to my church, I could weep with them and I could mourn with them because they're hurting and they're grieved, right? I can associate to their pain of the loss of their son. Now, that doesn't mean that I have to, with that, agree that their son's action was right or wrong, right? That remains to be seen. I don't have any of the evidence. I don't know what happened. He may have been uh, stealing from someone's house and uh, he may have attacked, you know, we see that he kind of approaches the individual with the gun and so on and so forth, right? But nonetheless, I don't bring that up and say, well, wait for all the evidence, mom. You know, I'm grieving with her. I know her personally. I embrace her. I love her. I pray for her and her family. I see what I can do to help her. But for me, as someone who doesn't know their family, I and I'm grieved, right? If I know, you know, them personally, but for me, for someone who's on the outside looking in, I'm grieved as a Christian because this person dies without Christ, potentially, right? And and I don't know whether or not this was just or not. I don't know if this per, these families were protecting their rights and they had the right to bear arms, so so they were protecting themselves, whatever the case is. So so what these guys would have you to think is that if any time a black person is killed regardless of the nearness of your association with them, you need to weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn, right? As if 
uh, that and agree with the conclusions of you know with why you're weeping with them. So, you know, in the same way that you have your wife be molested or assaulted, right? And she tells you, and you you weep with her, you believe her automatically. Okay, well, what if this is a scenario in which I'm Pharaoh and my wife, I don't know this, but my wife is actually trying to sleep with Joseph. And Joseph resists her and resists her and resists her. Finally, he runs away from her. And she grabs his jacket and she decides to scream rape, 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 because she knows that if Joseph tells Pharaoh that she has been trying to lay with him, that she may ultimately be put to death. So she lies and says that Joseph tried to rape her and to come into her, right? Uh, so, so I can believe my wife, right? And, and, and there's no investigation and I can believe my wife. I'm believing and embracing a lie. It doesn't matter if it's my wife. If she's telling a lie and that lie, and I, and, and I don't know it's a lie yet. I can cry with her and weep with her. But if it comes to the surface that my wife lied, then justice doesn't evade my wife. Justice must be prevailed and my wife must receive justice. So, you know, just because someone is killed at the hands of another individual doesn't mean that we can't wait or seek out more information in order to make informed decisions. Now, that was a lot there, but I'm going to let them finish. Your yeah. child has been hurt. Like, let's not listen in the sense of, well, we'll get to it and let's talk. No, like I'm listening right now because I got to take immediate action because things are happening that is hurting me. Yeah. You know, and I just think that we got to, and again, this is all on the premise that black people are being disproportionately killed at the hands of white police officers. Okay, because the question was, have we made progress since Ferguson? The assumption is that Ferguson, that Michael Brown was unjustly killed, which I briefly talked about here. I'll leave a video in the description as well with some other resources that show that he was not unjustly killed. The officer, Darren Wilson, acted in self-defense. So again, as Christians, again, these are Christian pastors in the Southern Baptist Convention. They're shepherding God's flock. And this is very troubling. So let me let them finish. Like, feel the essence of it. And what, I, and what we need more is that we need more prophets. Of in other words, we need more white people to agree with our narrative. The narrative that black people are being disproportionately killed at the hands of white officers. We need more white prophets to trumpet that message. All races and all genders to be raised up and to speak in the same way they spoke in the days in the biblical time, saying, like, look, like, look up, see your eye, look and see that there's an injustices. There are certain things that are happening, and we need to do it. And the problem is that only time where like the people are called to look up is like African Americans, like me or Curtis or whatever, is like is like you're, you people are bringing us on to, to to say it. We need more, like if you're listening to me, we need more prophets white evangelical prophets to say like to take the stuff that they've been listening and to apply it in the same way that their wife is being like affected by it and let's not just say well let me get all the facts first before i say anything because that's not your posture if you're if someone close to you is going to be you know addressed so all this is shameful this is shameful no, this is shameful. These are leaders in the Southern Baptist Convention who are going to disciple the flock of God on justice. And it's astonishing to me that in the name of justice, they promote unjust ways. They, 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 they embrace injustice. It's astonishing to me. It's it's like God has blinded the eyes of these teachers and he's caused them to believe a lie. It's astonishing to me. These men have believed a lie and they're 
teaching lies to the flock of God's people. Let that sink in. And your money is going to them. And you're eventually, I hope not, going to believe this message because not only are these pastors saying it, and you may buy one of Dahadi Lewis's books, or you may go to one of their woke conferences, or your pastor may embrace some of their ideologies, or your Sunday school teacher may embrace some of their ideologies. And they're going to bring in this white fragility. They're going to bring in the Black Lives Matter narrative. They're going to bring in the narrative that Black people are being disproportionately murdered at the hands of white officers. We are in a lot of trouble. We are in a lot of trouble. All I'm saying is, is that we can do it in a way. That's why I'm saying go to the prophets. We can do it in a very biblical, in a very God honoring way. I'm not talking about coming out with divisiveness, divisive language. This is like, divisive. I think that the goal of all of our communication is reconciliation. And the goal of all our communication is reconciliation. I want you to hear this. I really believe that you can have rec you you can have justice without reconciliation, but you can have justice without reconciliation. I want you to hear that because ultimately in the gospel, justice takes place in the death of Christ, right? He identifies himself with his covenant people, takes on our sin. The wrath of God, the righteous, holy wrath of God falls on the son as he becomes our substitute. Justice takes place. Jesus absorbs the wrath of God, dies the death we deserve to die, right? He is buried and he's raised from the grave so that we can be reconciled to God. So there is justice. And as a result of justice comes reconciliation. What he's saying is that white people need to acknowledge the wrong or the injustice. And only when that happens can there be reconciliation. Okay? So I'm going to let him finish that. But ultimately, you can't have true reconciliation without justice. And we you can't have true reconciliation without justice. That has already been accomplished in Christ. You see, these are woke ideologies, right? In the woke movement, right? Jesus says it is finished. In the woke movement, they say it's not finished yet. There's still more work to be done. Justice took place at the cross, but there's still more justice that needs to be seen evidenced by racial reconciliation because Christ didn't accomplish that sufficiently. This is troublesome. These are Southern Baptist pastors gone rogue. We know as believers that justice without reconciliation is what the Bible calls hell. And so the goal of a believer is not just simply justice, it's reconciliation. But we and the believer is any believer who has any believer has been reconciled to God and to man. Every believer has been reconciled to God and to man. Now that doesn't mean that the, the practical implications of reconciliation need to take place on a relational level, of course, right? On one to one level, but what he's advocating for is across ethnicity, ethnic boundaries, right? He, what he's advocating for is blacks and whites, and more specific, what he's advocating for is for white people to be reconciled to black people and acknowledging the injustices that take place against them at the hands of white officers. This is backwards. This is backwards. We got to be able to um, speak about righteousness and justice in order to have true reconciliation. And, and righteousness and justice must be according to God's standard. You don't have righteousness and justice apart from God's standard. Okay? So you can't... Righteousness and justice are not arbitrary 
ideas that come from the universe. Okay? Righteousness and justice are biblical standards that God lays out, and we, as followers of Christ, are to seek out and to understand by virtue of understanding what he said in his word. Okay? So, for example, when a black person is killed, okay, we can grieve as believers, and I'm using just black individuals now because that's the narrative here, right? Black people are being disproportionately killed at the hands of white white officers, okay? So when a black person is killed or a person of color is killed at the hands of a white officer, what is our response? We can grieve in that a sinner or an individual is killed and they, they may be dead in their sin. Now, we can also, we can also praise God in that the 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 individuals that God has put in place if, if let's say this person is a criminal okay we grieve the death of the individual because their eternal state is sealed but we praise God because righteousness is upheld okay even if it's at the expense of a man's death righteousness is exalted because justice is evidenced when the wicked are cut off, the righteous excel. So, so again, I'm not saying, well, then kill the wicked. No, because the civil government has the right to bear the sword, not the ecclesiastical church, right? Not the church, not the individual, but the civil government. So if an individual who is a murderer and a killer and a thief, right? kills someone or seeks to kill an officer or even an, 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 a, a, just a common individual, if they seek to kill someone and they're killed in the process, then justice, the, the, the civil government has enacted justice. Now, again, this if there's police brutality, for example, then, then justice will prevail in bringing about righteous judgment toward the civil authority who enacted Police brutality. I, I'm. I hope I'm trying. I'm trying to make sense. There's so much here. Uh, when you understand, when you when you think through this this concept of biblical justice, but my, the point is, is that biblical justice must be in accordance with God's standard laid out in His Word. It isn't arbitrary, and it isn't arbitrary showing favoritism on the basis of the color of one's skin. Let's continue. That's why Jesus came down and he died on the cross so that God can both have justice, but he can also have reconciliation, you know, yeah. for us. And so we got to we can't we kind of look at these things as two. And all I'm saying is that we need more prophets and not just people like me or people like Curtis who look like us and talk like us who are supposed to be the experts on race. We need more people sure. to take on the burden and, and to raise up as prophets in a God honoring way and to speak. OK, well, that ends today. Uh, that was the 1235 mark to the 1618 mark. And the question was, have we made progress since Ferguson? There's going to be several parts to this series because I really want to do my best to listen and break down what they say and hopefully add something productive to the conversation to give us a different perspective on all this is taking place in the Southern Baptist Convention and not just the Southern Baptist Convention, but in your local church when it comes to this woke critical race theory ideology. Uh, you know, Dehadi Lewis says that we need prophets, but we don't need false prophets. Okay, we don't need prophets who are prophesying or speaking forward false ideas. We need prophets who are going to speak the truth into the church and the culture concerning the false ideologies that they're embracing. That's what we need, right? That's what we need. The world, this isn't countercultural, what he's talking about. This is feeding right into the message of the world. This, you know, the, he's a Black Lives Matter proponent, and the only difference is, is that he has a Christian jacket on. Okay, and I'm talking about the ideas that he's promoting. I don't know him personally. The ideas that he's promoting is 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 liberal ideas cloaked with orthodox Christianity. 
Okay? As believers, we look at situations through the lens of the scripture, and we let the word of God be our final authority on all these matters. So yeah, we need prophets, but we don't need false prophets. We don't need prophets who are going to tickle the ears of men and let them hear what they want to hear. We need prophets who are going to stand on the word of God and say, thus saith the Lord, right? God has put forward standards of justice and anyone who breaches God's law and is a tyrant in the culture and breaks the law, according to Romans 13, he has put forth his deacons to lay down justice. It's the kind of prophets we need who speak the truth in love, who is not going to show favoritism on the basis of one's skin color. That's the kind of prophets we need. Well, I'm going to stop here. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Proverbial Life Podcast. If you have any questions, if you have any comments, if there's anything I said that you want to kind of uh, dig in a little deeper on and maybe you want me to or you want me to dig in a little deeper on, please let me know. Uh, also, am I tripping? Where am I tripping? Where am I bugging? Where am I going off? Where am I wrong at? Let me know. Leave a comment behind. Are they tripping? Are they wrong? Or have they gone off at the deep end? Have they gone rogue? If that's the case, also leave a comment. Leave a, if that's the case, also please leave a comment behind. This is the proverbial life. If you have not subscribed to the podcast, please do so. Hit that notification bell so you get all the videos when they are released. Until next time, look to Christ, live wisely, and leave a legacy behind for generations to follow. Grace and peace.